Good morning on this Sunday, January 14th, and welcome to the Georgia gang. They are fired up, let me tell you. Governor Brian Kemp lays out his priorities on this first week of the 2024 legislative session. Also, bombshell allegations against Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and a prosecutor she picked for the election interference case against former President Donald Trump and 18 others. And a Cobb County judge has ruled Cobb commissioners do not have the authority to change the county's electoral map. Melita Filtharen and Janelle are all here. Y'all gonna be okay? <laughs> <laughs> the debate and discussion begin right now. From the Fox 5 studios, the Georgia Gang starts now. Governor Brian Kemp delivered his State of the State address at the state capitol this week, outlining his priorities for this session, which includes a 4% pay raise for all state employees and a bonus for state law enforcement officers. He also used his speech to criticize the Biden administration, as Democrats called it a campaign speech with a lot of mixed messages. The state of our state is strong, growing, and full of opportunity. Let's use this session to keep it that way. Tax relief and a big investment in K-12 education among Governor Brian Kemp's budget priorities this legislative session. We have accomplished so much over the last five years, despite unprecedented times and challenges. Kemp said some of those challenges were created by the Biden administration, including crushing inflation, dysfunction in Washington, the crisis at the border, and unrest overseas. This session, he's pushing for more Georgia tax cuts, funding for water and sewer projects, and an additional $1.5 billion for transportation projects. He's requesting $1.5 billion in additional funding for K-12 education and more money for school safety enhancements. The governor said his administration will work to get a school voucher bill passed. I firmly believe we can take an all-of-the-above approach to education, whether it's public, private, homeschooling, charter, or otherwise. Democrats criticized the governor's plan and said the state should be spending more money to address pressing issues like Medicaid expansion. From our caucus's perspective, it is much of the same. The governor is uninterested in fighting for ordinary, everyday Georgians. Now, in his speech, Governor Kemp also expressed his support for the Atlanta Police and Fire Training Facility. Janelle, to you first this week, your thoughts on the governor's priorities and really the mm -hmm. tone of his speech. Yeah, so I was there, and um, so I was able to listen to it firsthand, but I also was at Eggs and Issues, so I'm going to kind of tie it all together because okay. I feel like he gave us both. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was when he stated that, you know, we're strong, growing, and prosperous as far as the state goes. He said he trusts our citizens more than we trust the government. A lot of his priorities and a lot of the direction of his speech was around uh, making sure that we're not manipulating the market through too much government intervention. That's very right down the line of the party lines. Um, I also like that he talked about housing investment, the construction. Um, this was a little bit of exit issues, but the construction of the dental school in, uh, yes, in Georgia Southern, huge. And then he mentioned like the stopping of unions when it comes to government employees and government workers. And I thought that was a pretty powerful statement to make. Um, and then lastly, the investment into infrastructure, that is so necessary. I believe it was the new uh, chair of the chamber, um, Pedro Cherry, who said that they're anticipating about one million cars, more cars being on the road in 2030. That's about 750,000 more people. So in that case, we have to make sure we focus on infrastructure. So I thought that was some good points. Darren. Yeah, I'll, I'll do uh, my best to do exactly what Janelle just did and tie in the two. So the Eggs and Issues Breakfast, shout out to the Georgia Chamber and, and congratulations to Pedro Cherry, who's the incoming uh, chair. I just want to get that in. Um, it was it was very similar speeches, but different. You know, at the, at the Eggs and Issues Breakfast, you had Speaker John Burns, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor uh, Burt Jones and then you had the governor come on and it was very very clear that he wanted to take this moment to really point out the comparison the contrast between Georgia and the Biden administration but as Janelle just did a wonderful job of talking about all the things he talked about he quadrupled down on teachers uh, he also gave GBI state officials state of public officials safety officials a raise as well and state employees and so I think that well we're gonna have all these questions about what will happen with the surplus I mean clearly he is quadrupling down on his support for state 
workers. And then I think the last thing that was very important is that he talked about the growth along the southeastern coast of Georgia, also in North Georgia. He taunted a lot of the jobs and the unemployment rate being at a good place. But I think that what he really, really was trying to also do is make sure that the legislature understood that this is not a lame duck governor. This is a governor who is going to introduce legislation and be very, very active in this session. And Phil, he really went after the Biden administration and that's, you know, got a lot of folks talking about his future plans. Well, I think it was great. It was a good comparison between uh, what the Republican agenda is and what the Democrat agenda is. There is dysfunction up in Washington, D.C., as he talked about, and he said, but we're doing pretty good in Georgia. And he, he listed all the things, and Janelle and Theron had pointed out some of the things we're doing with our 16 million surplus, especially transportation. You know, I always like to look to see how both parties react when the governor talks, when they stand up and applaud, and when, then when they just sit and don't like it. You know, what it was sad to me, one takeaway was when Governor Kemp was talking about the tax cuts, we're giving back money to the people. All the Republicans stood up and clapped, and all the Democrats just sat there. Well, you know, that's a disgrace. That's the people's money. That tells you a lot about the Democratic Party. And so I could go on and on. I am glad to, to see that the pay raises when it, uh, for corrections officers, state troopers, uh, mental health case workers, et cetera, et cetera. All that was good. Melita, why do you think Democrats just sat when, it, when he was talking about well, tax cuts? Well, because beneath the good old boy demeanor that he displays as he talks, mm -hmm. and I think the contrast that Phil was talking about is not so much between um, in, the contrast really is Governor Kemp's demeanor and speaking spot style as compared to the warring factions within the Republican Party in Congress and as compared to the warring factions we see on a presidential debate stage. But the Democrats are not happy with the mean-spiritedness behind policies which leave Georgians sick and hungry by not expanding Medicaid, by refusing federal money for um, nutrition for students during the summer. So there is a lot within the budget that the Republicans and Democrats will, will talk about in the coming week, next week as they hear from department heads, and then in the weeks as they negotiate the fine points of this budget. You know, one thing um, that you got to compliment Speaker John Burns on something, and, and Melita, I know you hit on this as well. There was a mention from the Speaker of the House to say, hey, we're going to look at a alternative way that's feasible long term to expand Medicaid in this in this state. Now, that doesn't mean that it was a full throw, you know, like, hey, we're going to basically do it. But that is it. the most we've ever but heard. But that's the most we've ever heard. And then also, he, he, thought he said he was going to give the Pathways yeah, program give, a chance. He's going to give the Pathways yeah, that's program. That's Governor Kemp's program. And, and it, lastly, it's a failure. well, it's not. It just started. And then real quick, mental health. He said he wanted to do more on mental health. He wanted to pick up where the late Speaker uh, Ralston had basically made a lot of strides and, and make sure we put funding behind this effort. Yeah, I just want okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I just want to touch on Speaker Burns real quick. Um, his speech at Eggs and Issues was so strong. Um, I felt like he was the best that was there. And the reason why is because he was able to lay out his priorities. I like that he put them in different categories. And because, like you say, you mentioned uh, healthcare, mm -hmm. but there's something else he mentioned that we have to talk about, and that was AI. And I thought that was really strong as well. He talked about how they're going to go after that. And then I also, being a member on the board of corrections, I would definitely give him a shout out for mentioning working with our officers. Well, he also called for the eliminating those QR codes on ballots and more oversight of the Secretary of State's office, Melita. Yeah. Yes, he did. And, and it's interesting because he's calling for that just as there's the trial in Judge mm -hmm. Totenberg's courtroom We're gonna get to that. about that very issue. <laughs> but I think it is interesting to see some of the Republicans coming around to understanding that those QR codes are troublesome and that those machines can be hacked. All right, we'll leave it there because we're going to get um, to that trial in the third block. So up next, a new court filing with shocking allegations of an improper relationship between Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis and the prosecutor she picked for the election interference case against former President Donald Trump and others. Have a question or comment for the Georgia Gang? Email them at georgiagang at foxtv.com. One of the co-defendants in Fulton County's election interference case against former President Donald Trump has asked the judge to dismiss his indictment and disqualify District Attorney Fonnie Willis from further prosecutions, alleging that Willis had a romantic relationship with one of the other prosecutors in the case. The attorney for Michael Roman, a former White House aide who served as the director of Trump's Election Day operations, filed the motion stating that Willis 
and the other prosecutor have been profiting significantly from the prosecution at the expense of taxpayers. Now, the filing alleges that Willis and Norman Wade, the special prosecutor leading the case, Nathan. were romant romantically involved. Nathan Wade. Oh, Nathan Wade, sorry. sorry. <laughs> romantically involved before he was contracted to work on the case, calling it an improper clandestine relationship. Well, Theron, these are some bombshell allegations. Now, neither Fonnie Willis nor Wade have commented. We're also hearing that Willis has been subpoenaed in Wade's divorce proceedings. So you guys know what I'm going to say. Mm. Let's not rush to judgment. Um, because while there's two ways to look at this, Lori, there's the court filings, which the district attorney has said she will address these allegations in, in the court filing. But then there's also the court of public opinion. So let's start with the court filings. And so I think that, listen, the, the thing here is, is that it's not uncommon for people to hire prosecutors who they know, mm -hmm. who maybe they've worked with in the past and they've been friends. What we don't know is, are these allegations true that this attorney filed from a divorce filing? Uh, and so I think we have to wait and not rush the judgment and let that come out. Now there's the, pu the court of public opinion. And, you know, unfortunately in this day and age where it's just hypersensitive on both sides of the aisle, everything is just so, um, you know, is there collusion, is there corruption? Especially um, in this case. In this case. Mm -hmm. I think that as we take, we will know more on Monday. So, you know, most people will see this broadcast on Sunday. And then Monday or Tuesday, I feel like we'll be able to come back the following week and have more information. So I just don't want to get too caught up in the allegations on the personal relationship between a prosecutor who is qualified, by the way, to do the job. You can't question his ability to do his job. A district attorney who has been very methodical and patient and not really litigating things in the media. Uh, and I think that that's why her team has decided that she's going to respond in the court. Well, Phil, Congresswoman Mar Marjorie Taylor Greene, here we go, has already called for a criminal investigation into these um, allegations. So what are Republicans? I mean, this is, the Republicans have been going crazy over these allegations. Well, they're very serious and damaging allegations. Number one, this is a gift from God to former President Trump because uh, here you have not just Republicans, but I've talked to a lot of Democrat attorneys over the last few days. Uh, the fact is that there's a conflict of interest. That's the charge. That's the allegation, number one. Number two, there's a collusion charge. This Nathan Wade, uh, who's never tried a felony, had to get direction from the Biden White House. He even, I think, in my opinion, stupidly even put on the invoices that he was uh, meeting with Biden White House people to go after Trump. There's also the case of Fonnie Willis, the DA, violating her oath of office. It says in the Georgia Code very clearly that you cannot get unlawful compensation. And so you can go on and on uh, as to what charges are, are going to be looked at. I think that Attorney General Chris Carr might be looking at some state charges that might be violated too. So uh, the, the point here is if I was the judge in this case, I'm going to be seriously considering, and again, some of the Democrat attorneys I've talked to, to just disqualify Fonnie Willis uh, from the whole case. The whole DA's office ought to be taken away from this case. Melita, I think what's surprising is that we haven't heard anything from Fonnie Willis or Wade over these allegations. But this has been a very tight operation. There have been very few leaks. She has said she will respond in court as she should. Now, let's look at some of the things Phil has said. He's talking about the meetings with the White House. The path for getting previous administration documents, which are required for this case, is through the Office of White House Counsel. That is ordinary procedure. So it doesn't imply collusion. To get the documents during the time the grand jury was meeting, they had to meet with White House Counsel to have those documents to put in front of a grand jury. Now. There was no evidence of this relationship in the court filing. Also, a conflict of interest is when you are on opposite sides. Ms. Willis and he are on the same side. But what this case has done is it's deflected attention from the 13 charges faced by the twice impeached and thoroughly disgraced former president, and it's deflected attention from the seven felony counts that Roman Faces. And what it does is it adds fuel to the fire of Republican sponsored legislation which would try to pass new laws because their last attempt failed for prosecutorial oversight if, and sanctioning district attorneys. But isn't that on Fonnie Willis and Wade if these allegations are true? 
Why yeah. would they jeopardize this case? Because really, Republicans, I mean, Trump has already called for the, the charges to be dismissed. Janelle. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, for me, I boiled all this down to the fact that from the very beginning of this, it's been messy. Um, whenever you start anything from a position of animosity, a position of, I'm going to get you, you know, Fani was doing interviews where she was saying things like, you know, I'm going to have this done by a certain time, and it just, it felt like it was attacking rather than her just doing her job. We are, we have moved past you know, what's wrong and what's right. Now we're all about who do I like? Who do I not like? Who can I go get? Can I get you back? And when you start doing all of that, now you open it up, open yourself up to be attacked. And that's how this came about. At the end of the day, it's about whether or not we can trust her to be honest, because I feel like if this is a personal friend of yours, had she said that in the beginning, that my personal friend and I are gonna try this together, I think this may not have blown up the way it is because we technically don't have the facts. We don't, I don't wanna say that she's you know, doing anything because that hasn't happened. However, at the end of it all, it's all about the spirit at which this whole case was started. Darren. Look, the, the other thing that we, and I want to say sometimes, I know Melita wants to respond. The other thing that we got to also talk about, I want to get back to the qualifications of these two individuals, mm -hmm. all right? The district attorney who was duly elected in the county by the citizens of Georgia. This prosecutor has basically billed, and Phil mentioned, I mean, it's like you can't kid him on transparency, right? He literally has documented what he's done. And in those documents, this is an attorney, a special prosecutor who's charging $250 an hour. Now, most partners at most law firms across the state of Georgia, particularly Atlanta, are upwards to five or more and so so but some critics are saying he's never even tried a felony case in Georgia well but 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 he's a former prosecutor he's a former judge and he also had a very high profile case in Cobb County when he basically successfully prosecuted Willis had other experts oh, see I, I knew that I, I knew that cutoff was coming but he successfully successfully prosecuted the former Cobb County Sheriff with you know it was and it was a very tough case and so I think look Lori we, we, you see the price tag of six hundred and fifty-four thousand dollars, right? That's tax over several years. Yeah, oh, but over several years, mm -hmm. and I think that you can't hit the man on being transparent because it's clearly documented on what he's been doing, and 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 if you look at his qualifications and what the success of this case from the from the prosecutor standpoint, I think you got to say he's doing a good job. Would you say this if it was the if it was reversed? If this were these were Republicans that are in the exact same situation, would you say that exact same thing? So, Jenna, that's a good question. Notice what I've done. I have not use a Democrat or Republican in my sentence at all. I just, this is not about partisanship. What I'm saying uh. is this, no, no, what I'm saying is let's wait and get the facts and, 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 and not and rush to judge. Gotta go to Phil and then Melita, sure. we don't have a lot of time. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I, I think that we need to step back and look at the fact that uh, Ashley Merchant, who was the attorney for uh, Michael Roman, who's, who was the uh, defendant, the Trump guy, uh, she actually saw and this was in the filing, she actually saw what was in this divorce case. That's where a lot of the information came before it was sealed <coughs> by the judge. Now, I think that's very important uh, when it comes to a, and you can have a conflict of interest within the office. I don't know what you're talking about there. And, and it's, it is very political. The fact that you're going up to the Biden administration that are coordinating four different lawsuits against your leading opponent in the, in the November 24, uh, 2024 election, that's outrageous. Melita, fi final word. First off, the, in the appointment of a special prosecutor, the district attorney has full discretion for that. The county commission did not have to approve that, as some have alleged. And further, once a couple is legally separated, they are free to pursue relationships with whomever they choose. Mm. <laughs> a boss and an employee? Mm, okay, <laughs> we're gonna leave it divorced. there. <laughs> There's gonna be a lot more to talk about on this case next week, I'm sure. Up next, a Cobb County judge rules only the General Assembly has the power to draw district maps. Join the discussion on the Georgia Gang Facebook page and watch past episodes on the Georgia Gang YouTube channel. Cobb County says it plans to appeal a new ruling from Judge Ann Harris, who says only the General Assembly has the power over redistricting. Melita, back to you. Cobb tried to draw its own maps, and the judge said no. But as, as I mentioned, Cobb is appealing this decision. Yes, and also at the same time, in federal court, Judge 
um, Eleanor Ross has extended a deadline in a separate lawsuit over school board districts. So we can see the Cobb delegation, which is fairly evenly divided but dominated by Democrats, arguing a good bit in the coming days because those maps have to be ready in time for candidates to qualify in March. It's hard to keep track of what's going on in Cobb County in terms of the maps. It is. Uh, the issue here was uh, home rule and there's exceptions to the home rule legislation in the state of Georgia. The bottom line is the state legislature has the right to do these maps and the Democrat controlled Cobb County Commission tried to do their own uh, shenanigans and, and try to uh, dominate it and, and knife the Republicans. So they, it was political. They did it after the Republican dominated General Assembly went around the Democrat dominated Cobb County delegation in a complete reversal of normal read the policy exceptions. and procedure. Read the exceptions to the home rule uh, legislation. That's what I would, that's your homework assignment. All right, moving on. The federal trial over Georgia's voting machines has begun. Plaintiffs want Georgia to stop using the machines, saying that they're vulnerable. Theron? So, you know, we talked about this um, two weeks ago, right? And we said Georgia is going to be again in the spotlight when it comes to not just presidential elections, but how people feel about the security of our voting machines, right? And so this trial has basically, you know, put a lot of sort of doubt, but also I think it cleared up a lot of unanswered questions. And so the fact of the matter is, you know, as and Janelle asked me a question earlier, and I'll kind of ask this to the panel, you know, would we even be having this conversation if Donald Trump had actually won re election and had actually won Georgia? I don't think we would. Yes, we would. But because there was an all out attack and even places like Coffee County and Brian Tyson who's a uh, attorney in this case has basically said that there was no you know sort of one vote basically altered or misread in this in this Dominion voting machine not even in Coffee County now now Coffee County we've talked a lot about on this mm -hmm. case because it was what we saw in the video footage of Coffee County with the tampering of the voting machines which raised a lot of questions and so I think again this case is going to be going on a while and I think it will sort of dictate how the Secretary of State's office continues to work with local boards and elections to ensure election integrity. Janelle. Yeah, so my question is, um, if we're worried about the hacking aspect, and I've said this several times, I don't know why we keep talking about the hardware. We've, we need to talk about the software, right? Like, we, don't, we shouldn't have to replace the hardware if we can update the software and make sure the software is protected. Um, do I think we need to have that conversation? Yes. However, what I don't want to see is us moving back into the Stone Age, where we no longer are using technology, because then that's going to set us, particularly Republicans, on a bad path because we're going to be so far behind. We won't know what's going on. In a, in a time where we have AI, we can't start talking about things that are behind technology. <clears throat> uh, Phil, I mean, we remember the hanging chads in Florida. Exactly, and I think this will be very instructive when we have this uh, next couple weeks of experts coming in. Uh, Dr. Halderman, who did the uh, report that's been the center of controversy, will probably be testifying along with cybersecurity experts. We're going to learn a lot. This is not really about 2020. It's about 2024 and beyond and about election integrity and protecting our machines and uh, Dominion is on trial here the Dominion yeah. system. Yeah. Melita. Well and at the same time we, we won't hear in this trial from our Secretary of State because he appealed and has been told he doesn't have to testify and I still wonder what he doesn't want to have to testify <laughs> about and at the same time you have the State Elections Board trying to get clarity from the General Assembly about whether they, as an elections board, with two new members, a new chair and another new member, have the power to investigate the Secretary of State. So elections are going to be in all kinds of headlines between now and November. Yeah, I, I always find it interesting. I mean, you were talking about Brad, uh, Secretary Raffensperger. Um, when he was saying that everything was fair and free and everything was great, all the Democrats were rallying behind him. I mean, a lot of Democrats jumped in and, and was able to jump into our primary to help get him elected and push him across the aisle. But now we're like, Why, what are you not saying about this? I mean, well, it's, this it's, it's the hypocrisy for me. He hid the news of the Coffee County data breach and he didn't report it even though he knew about it and he's been hiding that. You didn't want him to report it because if he had a reported that during that time it would have killed the Democrats perspective. So at the end of the day everyone was on his side when he was saying that the election was free and fair and clear but now all of a sudden when we see that there's some discrepancies we're now opposite of him and that's what I don't like about this, this, the, the progressive push it's like it's, it's hypocrisy at its core. Okay. I gotta leave it there or else we won't have any time for winners and losers. Stay tuned, everyone. 
Time now for the week's winners and losers. All right, Janelle, we'll start with you. All right, Charlie Welsh, 16-year-old Charlie Welsh. If you're sitting with your dad, Chuck Welsh, he's telling you the truth. We are friends, and I do know him. <laughs> so I told him I was going to do this for you. Um, and then shout out to Erica Mitchell, board member Erica Mitchell. Um, she was sworn in as District 5 board member and the newly elected board chair of the Atlanta Board of Education. So ch kudos to her. And then lastly, um, if you are wanting to support Department of Corrections, we've had a lot about we've said a lot about it. But if you have great ideas and you are someone that you think can bring something to the table, come in and work for us. You know, we would love for you to, to apply to, to work with the Department of Corrections, so make sure you do that. All right, Melita. Well, I want to make a winner of everybody who's been working hard to plan the ceremonies, parades, and community volunteer opportunities, which will con commemorate the legacy of Reverend Martin Luther King this entire weekend. Mm -hmm. And I also want to make a, ma a winner of Mayor and Andre Dickens, because he's beginning his two-year term serving as chair of the Atlanta Metro Regional Commission, and he's the first Atlanta mayor to serve as chair of that board in a six-decade history. All right, Phil. You know, I'm going to make as my winner uh, State Trooper Jerry Parrish. He was seriously wounded uh, by this anarchist or communist, whoever it was, over at the uh, police training center site. And uh, he never got the, the, the publicity and the sympathy, in my opinion, in the mainstream media. I'm glad Governor Brian Kemp singled him out and his family, and uh, I'm glad that he's on the mend. And my other winner is uh, Ashley Merchant. She's the uh, uh, attorney that uh, did the bombshell filing the other day that really, I think, mortally wounds this. Uh, case. Real quick, Darren. Uh, basically, I just want to celebrate 50 years of the inauguration of Maynard Jackson. Uh, Andre Dickens hosted all the former mayors that came to Andrew Young to celebrate 50 years of excellence. <laughs> nice. We'll leave it there. Have a great week, everyone. See you next time.